Hello. In this lecture, we will look at art and culture in Europe and America during the post-war years from 1945 to approximately 1960. The three major movements during this post-war time period um, all deal with some form of abstraction, which when you consider the timeline of art and culture in the 20th century, abstraction is one of the major themes or currents in art and culture, beginning with the influence of the father of modernism and Paul Cezanne in, in post-impressionism. So it's no uh, coincidence that these artists who all look at the um, process of abstraction and stylization and simplification as a, a guide for um, the most significant and meaningful way to express themselves, they are trying to continue the, the process begun during the modernist era of the first two decades of the 20th century that seemed to be kind of paused by the war, as we've talked about in previous lecture. Now, each of these styles has a, uh, a connection to um, the techniques of some of the modernists, most notably the, um, the more textural techniques in painting in particular uh, of artists like uh, Brock in Cubism or Matisse in his, uh, his very painterly style. Now, the, the first major movement actually of this period actually begins in the early 1940s and it carries over into this later time period known as Abstract Expressionism. Abstract Expressionism is the first truly uh, American movement. Um, it is led and predominantly um, practiced by American painters or, or emigres to the United States. Um, we see uh, in these works, we see a, a realization, a physical realization of the artist aesthetic in their, and the state of mind at the time of them uh, making this specific work. So like um, other modernist painters um, where we see the work being very expressive in the moment, um, we don't see uh, we don't see um, the abstract expressionists connecting their works to subject matter as strongly as the modernists had. Um, there, it's a very direct and a very intense way of working. The, the clear leader of abstract expressionism is American Jackson Pollock. Now, Pollock's works um, are some of the, the most misunderstood and I think uh, misrepresented paintings in the history of art. During his own time, um, even, even some of the closest of his uh, colleagues really didn't quite fully appreciate and understand exactly what he was attempting to do and felt like that his works were maybe too intense. They were too intensely abstracted. Uh, and as such, they, they really disassociated the viewer. But when you, when you look carefully at Pollock's works, what you start to understand is that they're as arbitrary as they might seem. They, they, they tend to, people who dismiss Pollock tend to look at his works and just, and think, well, it's just splashed and splattered paint on the canvas 
And so what, what is it and why is it so important? Um, and I think that what, what that misunderstanding leads to is, um, or comes from where it comes from is a, a, a real lack of, um, care in examining the works really carefully in a way that we're not used to examining paintings. Um, you know, we've talked about in, with modernism, the goal was to try and find and establish this new visual language. And the modernists never fully achieved that goal, partly because the goal, um, the, the way that they were going about it was still so connected to the traditions of art and, and, and breaking those uh, relative connections, those connotations and denotations that we talked about. Um, so if you, in the, if you're, unwilling to just completely sever the painting from the, the tradition of art, from subject matter, from representation, from realization, then what you, you can't help but at some point connect in some way to a previous image or to, you're, you're not truly going to make something completely new. So Pollock, um, takes a risk and he tries to, um, instead of simply filtering his, uh, his subject matter or his style through, uh, through his technique, um, he tries a completely new technique and he tries to divorce that technique from subject matter. So you're not supposed to see anything. It is a complete denial of the illusion of painting. It is not a reference to anything else. It is simply what it is. It's, it's a recognition that um, those elements that we respond to in painting are at its core, at their fundamental core, they are simply what they are. They are line, they are color, they are shape, they are texture, they are value. And it is possible to use all those elements without referencing something else. He doesn't have to endeavor to make an, an image of anything. It can simply be exactly what it is. And so the only way to do that is to move purely away from the representation of some subject and move into an art and an imagery that is exactly what it is. It's just marks and brush strokes and drips. Um, he takes the, the canvas off the stretcher, off the vertical, puts it on the ground, and he, he moves around it. And as he moves around it, the, the paint hits the canvas in a way and it leaves the evidence of his movements. Um, whether he's brushing it, dripping it, dropping it, splattering it. It's, it is exactly that. It's exactly the evidence of his movements. Um, and he chooses the colors and he chooses the movements based upon what he's thinking and feeling at that moment. Um, and so it doesn't have to be more than that. What he's, his goal is for that we, so that we would understand that what we respond to in art is more than just, oh, that's a, a pretty picture of a landscape or a person or a, or still life or whatever it, you know, traditionally had to be. Now, I think that people often think that his works are overly simplistic, and they're really not. There, there really is a an attention to detail and in certain ways they are quite complex. Um, you know, you can't simply just pour the paint out over the canvas and come up with something that is going to be interesting, that's going to be textural, that's going to, you know, if he just simply splattered the paint on the canvas without any thought or care to 
how the the image was being built from these marks then it would it would seem very arbitrary whereas i think that what you find when you examine his works carefully is you see the layering of the way that the paint lays one on top of the other. And he chooses a media that is new. He chooses acrylic. He chooses latex paint. He used house paint. He used all kinds of different paints. Um, he chooses to unprime or uses prime canvases unprimed. So you're seeing everything. Every material is in its most raw, most uh, you know, unfettered state. And I think that that is a big part of what he was trying to do. He's trying to make an art that is the least processed um, as possible to, to make it to where you're seeing exactly what he did with the works. And, and you might, um, you know, agree or disagree with the success of the the quality or the technique of the image, um, you know, we, we, the big question is what to do with this, how to evaluate it. And in that, I think that he, he also takes great care to um, kind of force the viewer to not, there's no way to evaluate the success or failure of these paintings based upon the traditions of art. You cannot compare this to classicism uh, it just or to realism. It just won't work. Um, and it, it, it's absurd. It makes no sense. One wouldn't say, you know, oh, well, that's not a good painting because it's not realistic. Well, realistic for what? If there's no subject, if it really is just exactly what it is. Now, Pollock also, I think, is important beyond just what he does with, the, with his work in the personality, the identity that he creates. He, he is this quintessential new American artist. He's seen as, uh, and he's kind of has this, it, during his own life, he has this sort of uh, cult following and, um, you know, he's seen almost as a celebrity in the art world and in just in, in normal society. He's, there's a, a uh, very important um, uh, Life magazine article uh, where with with the photo that you see here and others of him actually working, um, you know, and, and he created this new style of what they dubbed action painting. That, you know, the action that you see as he's moving around making these images is that's what's recorded by the painting itself. Now, the, the layering of the paint is actually quite interesting because what happens is that you almost see the, um, the passage of time in those layers. You know, it's, it's like uh, the, the rings of a tree or um, the sedimentary rock is, you know, is, is the, in the way that the paint layers, one color, one mark, one drip, one drop over the top of the other. And, you know, those elements, though, of value and color and light and um, texture, the, they're all still there. And the, the paintings really are uh, quite interesting. And it's, this is what, you know, sometimes it really, uh, you struggle to understand the difference between seeing works of art in reproduction or in person, this is one of those times that when you see them in person, they are dramatically different um, because they're large, they are imposing, um, and they are quite interesting to look at the, the closer you get because that's when you really can see some of those, those intricate uh, layerings of the painting. Now, the way that um, that Pollock's style evolves, you know, he comes out of. He's actually trained by uh, in New York. He he goes and studies at the Art Students League with uh, some famous German expressionists who had emigrated just after the First World War and the lead up to the Second World War to New York, and they're teaching there. And one of the things that he learns from them uh, is that 
the more direct or that he his as his style evolves the more direct the paintings can touch on both his own emotions and expressions and then communicate those in some way as directly as possible to the viewer you know that's his goal and so he he's trying to cut out the need for a narrative the need for a subject matter the need for um connotation and denotation there's neither here you're not supposed to look at it and see anything and that's one of the hardest things for viewers initially to do with abstract expression with Pollock's work is they we all want to we're so programmed to look at an image and say oh well what is that because that seems to be the way that we see everything but I think that when you allow yourself as the viewer to get past that what you ultimately start to enjoy is the beauty in just those rawest things the beauty in that color the beauty in that texture and that and and even to a certain extent the beauty in those chance elements and the way that they happen um, without a conscious control you know i think that what pollock was so successful at doing was that others hadn't been before was to create a truly new style in painting you know it's as hard as others had attempted for the 50 years before him to make something new um, as long as and this is what abstract expression is finally just decided as long as there really was a connection to a past style technique subject matter whatever then there was always going to be this level of remove this level of a separation from the from the actual physical being work and the the response and the viewer um you know that you're not you have to kind of dispend uh suspend your your thought process that i'm not looking at a painting i'm looking at some sort of you know illusion but there is absolutely no way to mistake this for something else and that's that's really unique now other abs so abstract expressionism by definition is not going to be a unified style in technique each artist is going to experiment with their own techniques but what it's going to have in common is this willingness to move move at various places and levels away from those traditions. Willem de Kooning in his works has this raw power and intention intensity with the way that he makes marks on the canvas um, and, and his you know will absolute fearlessness when it comes to um, not giving the the viewer or the world an aesthetic that it's that we're used to um, you know what's what de Kooning's really good at is giving us this aesthetic that says the the deconstructed the broken the the those the the a harmonious the the those things that seem to clash and break against each other those can be beautiful as well those can be you know it doesn't have to be uh, this sort of unified image that it can be raw and visceral and and really intense and there can be beauty in that as well de kooning's paintings um tend to be different than pollock's in that he's not as um you know absolute with his negation of subject matter we see elements of figures we see elements of you know natural things um, but he, it's clear he's not intending this these works to be representational now he, it's also clear I think that um, abstract expressionism the aesthetic of abstract expressionism is one that um, challenges rather than accommodates the viewer it's not one that's going to give us safe pretty pictures uh, it's willing to risk and to say you know this is a, a different 
point of view, and it's a different way of looking at painting and looking at the world. And so as such, it might lead to some disharmony, and that's okay. You know, ultimately, I think for de Kooning, what he was most interested in is line. You know, he wanted to make images that are made of marks and that use line and that, you know, in a direct way. And those lines don't necessarily have to add up to anything other than what they are. They're not necessarily, you know, we used to think about lines in terms of, oh, well, is it a contour of an object? Is it the outline of a shape? Is it the, you know, is it organic? Is it geometric? But de Kooning says that there's a new, a different way of looking at line. You, you could just look at line uh, in a more direct way. Um, you know, the, it doesn't have to add up to anything. It doesn't have to ha be referential to anything. You know, and, and this is something that we, and I think, intuitively understand, but we push ourselves away from the, the more we, um, as we develop a style of mark making or drawing or painting or, you know, that it should add up to something. It should, you know, a line simply just shouldn't be a line because in that way, if it is, then it's, you know, it's something else. It's more, perhaps. We've, we've got this attitude that the line that becomes the outline of a figure is more than another line, you know, than these lines, for instance, that you're not supposed to look at this and see anything. It just is exactly what it is. It's just these lines and shapes. Now, as abstract expressionism evolves as a style, um, each, you know, each artist is going to kind of carve out their niche, their territory. So for de Kooning, it's line. For Pollock, it's texture and, and asymmetry in term, and, and uh, kind of an antithetical approach to subject matter. And for Rothko, it's color. Rothko is known as a color field painter. In fact, he, he spawns and inspires a whole movement in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, um, into this color theory painting. Artists like Ellsworth Kelly, and then much later, somebody like, um, uh, you know, or painters of, of today even, they borrow heavily um, from Rothko in the way that, that he used color and the way that he... Um, understood color you know he he these paintings um they have these intense intense colors and the juxtaposition of the colors is really interesting and dramatic um when you you see these paintings in person they tend to kind of vibrate with color and the color is so intense and that part of that has to do with some of these new materials acrylic paint was new and acrylic you know, which is sort of a plastic paint, um, it is because of the chemical nature of it can get, you can get some really, really intense pigments. Um, and that's, that's something that Rothko was just uh, really interested in, in how, the, how he used these really bright, intense colors and juxtaposed them against each other. Um, and I think that what made his paintings interesting um, is that the he's also exploring in a two-dimensional painting why we see an area as ground you know we're we're used to reading and interpreting paintings as for traditionally especially landscapes as foreground middle ground background you know the area at the bottom closest to the viewer is the foreground and it's going to be one value usually a dark slightly darker value and then a middle ground which is the area in between the foreground and the background and that middle ground area is usually slightly uh hazier and lighter in value and then the background which is usually lighter you know this light sky and then this darker ground. Well, Rothko is interested in the way that these color choices can affect 
how we re read what comes forward, what goes back, how we read and interpret these areas, these grounds. They're very simple. And, and simplification oftentimes is also dismissed. I think Rothko doesn't get the, the credit that he deserves for, the, for his technique. His technique is very interesting. It's sometimes harder to do something simple than it is something complex. Um, because when you do something complex uh, and you, you know, m make one small error, perhaps it's easier to miss that error in the midst of that. Now, the, a simultaneous kind of development is this uh, movement of post-painterly abstraction that's happening uh, all through the 1950s and into the 60s, artists like, uh, and partially inspired and a kind of an extension of the ideas of people like uh, Pollock and Rothko, Ellsworth Kelly, um, and other uh, other members of this movement, they, um, what they try and do is to bring a little, little bit more of a, a, an orderly approach to what's happening with color theory. Kelly uses geometry, but in a, still in a simplistic way. Um, still not referencing necessarily a specific subject, but to a, in a slightly more complex way than, say, Rothko does. Um, you know, we see Kelly exploring the way that color works um, in, in a sense that, uh, you know, what he's trying to do is to figure out how what what this really means what what this type of abstraction really means for painting um you know if you you take away and limit as much as possible everything about the painting other than color then what what you know what what's what are the possibilities you know th this is um a very limiting approach and it's it's experimental um, in a way that we had not seen before. Kelly's works are very large, and you know he's trying to kind of solve problems in his work. Um, a simple question, you know, how to use vibrancy versus value versus you know the where on the spectrum of color that color lies and how they all relate to each other what reads as as positive what reads as negative you know this is a really simple painting it's basically just four areas of color and two of which are the same and so what reads as positive, what reads as negative in our view? So is the blue a shape or is the blue the background? Is the green a shape? Is the green a ground? Is the orange the foreground? Is the orange something else? You know, what is it? Or is it simply just color? And, you know, we're used to seeing things and looking into paintings for things. But I think what, what we see with... This work is a pure exploration of this kind of abstraction. Frank Stella takes that and applies some geometry. He, you know, superimposing circles and squares, what comes forward, what goes back. Um, also, remember that we're moving towards, at this point, a more digital age. We're moving towards uh, a more mechanical look at things, you know. So what is it possible to do these same things, but with an element of precision and bringing some precision to the work? Does that change its effect? Do we read it and interpret it differently? What, you know, 
the way that colors relate to each other based upon the the shapes and forms and how they're what what they're put next to. I think um, this work, these paintings, this style is very risky because it's easy to dismiss. It's easy to say there's no real skill or talent here. But I think that that's that that's a, an unfortunate, you know, um, interpretation. I think that with that sometimes it takes more skill, more talent to do something simple, more creativity to do something simple than it does to do something overtly complex, or, for that matter, to do something that has just simply mimicking or copying what's been done before. You know, for these artists, painting is not, it's an act, it's a process. I mean, the, the way it is for all artists, but they're simply saying that my process is valuable, that, that in fact it's beautiful. And the more I just share this process with you, the more you'll understand. So simply just, you know, to do a series of paintings of just black, on on the canvas and the whole image is just black and how can I do that how limiting can I be and still make something that is interesting Helen Frankenthaler is um, she takes some of this abstraction and but she does it in a much looser style um, what's interesting about her works is that people often see things in them that was never really an intention. It, it might be there kind of in more in sort of the, the mind, but not necessarily in the body. Um, a lot of people see her works as being reminiscent of landscapes or flowers. Um, but I think that that is purely our need to, in, to see things in works. Um, I don't think that there's a direct intention necessarily other than to say that these works are um, inspired by just the beauty of color and the way that color is, you know, is so much a part of where we see and find beauty. When we think about the most beautiful things or, or what beauty is, we very often think about the richness of the color of nature. Now, I think that what happens to art and culture after the war is there's been this period between the wars where life um, had uh, obviously uh, was it, it dominated and everything that was happening was dominated by what was happening in society and war. And... A lot of painters who are moving around, a lot of artists are moving, a lot of they're changing. And I think that there's this idea that in order to move all of society forward, there needed to be a new art. There needed to be some uh, kind of a new approach. And after the war, New York is firmly establishing itself as the center of the art world. The, the you know, some major galleries, major artists, major exhibitions, major museums are being, and collections are being built in and around New York. Um, and, and so what's happening is that artists are um, feeling a lot of empowerment to uh, expand upon some of these new ideas. Don't look back, you know, at the, at the war period or at the time before, you simply try and make something new because that's that's ultimately the way to dispel the the problems of the wartime. And David Smith is a sculptor who tries to experiment with some of these same abstractionist ideas. Um, Smith's work is is interesting because sculpture is much harder to remove. You know, if you strip down a painting to line and form and color, well, you strip down a sculpture to form, but still all form is going to be referential in some way or another. I mean, you're going to reference things in form because everything in the world has form. So how do you make something new? How do you make new forms? I think ultimately what 
Smith tries to do is to not necessarily find the newness or find the uh, the um, the tech in the technique or in the form itself, but in the arrangement, in the compositions, in the in the style, in the way that he puts these forms together. That's unexpected, you know. The the way that he balances things. Um, I think you know as. as each artist has their own niche and their own thing. And for Smith, it's about balance. Um, it's about using elements in a slightly unexpected way. And sculpture and painter, um, this is at this point, you know, there's a, a real um, separation in art. Um, before in the earlier time, earlier 20th century, in the, in the 19th century, artists were artists, and regardless of what their, their their technique or materials, they would be able to communicate and share ideas. But it's at this point where we really start to see a separation, and that's actually happening all over society. We see this push towards specialization of labor, specialization of study, fields of study. We don't have generalists in things anymore. Now we have specialists. And so, you know, artists were expected to be a specialist. And Smith is one of those rare artists, rare sculptors in particular, who spends a lot of time around painters. Um, a lot of times painters and sculptors and artists of different genres and different media don't, don't mix. They don't spend a lot of time together. But he's one who... Uh, really knew he knew Pollock and Rothko and all the others and and spent time with them and was inspired by them. Sculpture of the time though is is really interesting because as it moves towards finding a new, you know, if the goal is to make something new, what you have to do is to figure out, okay, well, what are those elements of sculpture that make it unique that makes sculpture a little bit different than say than painting um, and I think for artists like uh, Louise Nevelson who we see here or Louise Bourget who we'll look at in a minute what they decided is that sculpture had a presence that painting could never have sculpture had the ability to exist and live and impose its presence on the viewer in a way that a painting couldn't Painting seems like a uh, an arbitrary, almost uh, descriptor of form versus being the actual form itself. It, it's a decoration. It's an adornment to a wall or to a space, whereas the sculpture exists in the space, and as such, it has a different power. Now, for Nevelson, her works... Uh, are quite interesting because a lot of times she uses things that are cast off, bits and pieces that she finds, and she puts them together like Smith does, putting forms together in a new way. Now, what makes this sculpture interesting is, or the, her, her work interesting and this style interesting, is how... Um, it really is a different way of of looking at what the process of sculpture is. Um, you know, we, for thousands of years, the process of sculpture had been either additive or reductive. Uh, it had been about carving or casting. Well, now these artists are going to say, no, sculpture can also just simply be about combining it's a, an assemblage, is what the French call it, approach. It's about taking things, no matter how disparate, and putting them together and finding a way that those forms not only make sense, but make something interesting. Um, it can be referential or it can be not. It, it could just simply be purely geometric. Louise Bourget is one of the most interesting artists of the last 50 years. Her works... Uh, play on the psychological. Her works are, she's incredibly inspirational and influential on artists of the last 35 years. Um, 
because of the way that she uses form, but also because of the way that her works interact with the viewer. She made a series of these uh, very, very large, you get a sense of the scale here, uh, of these metallic uh, forms, and of course, very reminiscent of a spider, although not directly uh, an image of a spider, but just simply the scale here, the proportion, the, the form itself, and then to put this in a public place, you know, it, it's, it's very much about um, our relationship with objects and the way that we see it. You know, this, this work makes people uncomfortable, and that's on purpose. She wants to get your attention, to grab it, and to make you uncomfortable. To make, well, why are you uncomfortable? Um, you know, people very often will see these and go out of their way to not, not go near them because they're so, uh, they have this, such a this strong connection and reaction to spiders. And so she knows that, of course. And so what she's doing is she's saying, okay, I'm going to make a sculpture that plays off of that and that forces the viewer to see this, in, this sculpture, not spiders. She's not trying to make a statement about spiders. She's trying to make a statement about her art and the viewer and that relationship between the two. She wants to to make that or to force that reaction. And, you know, a lot of her work has that um, that very forced reaction in it, you know, causing the viewer to be slightly uncomfortable because you're not sure what's happening or what you're looking at or why you're looking at it and what the 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 imagery is supposed to mean and there's not really that it's not supposed to mean ultimately other anything other than what it does mean which is that that feeling that kind of uncomfortable tense feeling and in that way you know that's something that sculpture that her sculpture does that we hadn't seen uh, in quite a long time but there, not that it's not in art but we hadn't really seen this uh, directness, this kind of blatant and aggressive approach in quite some time. Now, what we'll see is that as art moves out of this time period and into the more contemporary age, we'll see art will go in very di different directions, but all of them about finding a very specific approach to connect to the viewer uh, in in, as, as we're evolving and progressing into this technological age.